Hello, buongiorno, welcome to my review of the Gothic classic, The Castle of Otranto. Published in 1764, this book is often credited as launching the Gothic movement in literature, obviously. It is occasionally inflicted on school children by cruel English teachers, and the plot follows Manfred, who has claimed the title of Otranto and its castle, an ancient prophecy promises destruction, and Manfred wants to secure his position by marrying Conrad, his weakling son, to Isabella, who is the daughter of the local king. That king is away in the Holy Lands and Manfred has, through unspecified means, dishonourable obviously, whisked her away from her appointed guardians. On the wedding day, an enormous helmet falls from the sky and crushes Conrad dead. Manfred is terrified that the prophecy is coming true, that his family and his legacy are doomed. Theodore, a peasant, observes that the statue of the castle's founder is missing its head. Ever superstitious, Manfred has his people imprison him under the helmet. Apparently not noticing the man-sized escape hole its impact has caused in the ground. But Manfred now turns his attention to Isabella. He plots to divorce his wife, Hippolyta, in order that he could marry Isabella himself. Not exactly thrilled by the prospect, Isabella attempts to flee the castle. She is aided by Theodore, who has escaped himself, aided by an enormous escape hole caused by a helmet falling from the sky. She makes it to the nearby church. Manfred, infuriated, sentences Theodore to death. The friar of the church, Jerome, begs him to reconsider when he notices a birthmark on Theodore's shoulder because it turns out that Theodore is Jerome's long-lost son. Manfred uses this as leverage, though, saying that if Isabella is not returned to him, he will kill Theodore. Returning to the church, however, Friar Jerome discovers that Isabella has fled again. All these exciting goings-on are interrupted by knights from Friedrich, who asserts that he has a greater claim to the title of Otranto and they demand the return of Friedrich's daughter, Isabella. Manfred and the knights search for her. Theodore is released from his cell by Matilda, Manfred's daughter, and donning armour, he joins the search. He finds Isabella first, and though he is enamoured with Matilda, he vows to protect her. One of the knights finds them, but Theodore thinks he has been sent by Manfred, and the two fight. The knight is badly injured enough that it's assumed that he will die, and it turns out that the knight is none other than Friedrich himself, Isabella's father. Because, it turns out, Friedrich was not dead in the Holy Land, as everyone thought, but he was freed, and he bumped into a hermit who was there to tell him that he must return to Otranto and sort out the usurper Manfred. Frederick recovers as rapidly as a footballer from a faked injury, and it turns out he's in love with Matilda now. And it turns out that the two men are willing to set aside their previous enmity in order to marry each other's daughters. That is, until a ghostly spirit warns Frederick not to. The two princesses, Matilda and Isabella, wail at each other for an excruciating chapter as they try to decide who should love Theodore, even though they're princesses and he's a peasant, so neither of them can. Manfred returns to the church and thinks that he sees Isabella with Manfred, so he stabs her, but it turns out he's killed Matilda. Then it turns out that Theodore was the actual heir to Otranto all along. A spirit declares the prophecy fulfilled and the castle collapses, which seems a really harsh penalty on its new owner. Manfred and Hippolyta spend the rest of their days in a monastery and Theodore marries Isabella because she can understand his pain. Naturally unmentioned by the author is that she can expect a lifetime of knowing he's thinking about Matilda every time they're together. And I'm sure that you noticed in the plot description the sheer number of things that just turn out because the story relies very heavily on strange twists and revelations that are all explained after the event. There is very little foreshadowing or setup. In more modern times, the story would feel clunky to say the least. In terms of pace, it's very uneven as well. The beginning moves with a brisk energy personified by Manfred stomping around his castle in fits of fear and anger. That changes in the exchanges between the princesses, which are the sort of melodrama and screeching that is something of a staple of both the era and the genre that would follow. The you're more virtuous than me, no you are, that fills all of chapter four is excruciatingly painful to read. Exasperated further by the fact that Walpole does not use any punctuation to denote who is speaking or when the speaker changes. The strengths of the novel are established in the first chapter. Manfred is an engaging villain and Isabella a suitably imperiled damsel. The castle is a fitting warren of secret passages and tunnels, but when the attention switches to the perfect and perfectly tedious Theodore, things lose their way and become a lot less interesting. 
Frederick too seems to flip-flop between hatred and tolerance of Manfred in a way that is almost hysterical. Manfred is pretty much the only character that rings true in the book. His motivations are completely consistent and he's an entertaining bad guy. However, the emotional extremes of Castle of Otranto would become one of the defining characteristics of the genre. Professor Bowen of the British Library has a short essay in which he lays out the typical characteristics of the Gothic genre and we can find them all in abundance here. The castle is a warren of secret tunnels and doors, a gallery of monstrous apparitions and moving portraits whose influence can be felt running through Dracula's castle and Hogwarts. With its adjoining monastery, it's a place where giants lurk between doorways and the waning of religious influence is felt. The ancient prophecy that dooms Manfred's line and instigates his pursuit of Isabella is one example of the modern being under threat. The threatened end of his lineage is the instigating action for the whole of the story. Walpole's Paratext too claims that this is a novel out of its time. A lost medieval text that's been found. The hermit in Palestine awaits Friedrich with a message from an earlier time too and this sets his plot in motion. Friedrich is considered to have died in the Holy Land, but returns in disguise in order to be present at the castle before his allotted arrival. Both Friedrich and Manfred make claims to the strongest family link to the Otranto title, but only one of them knows that theirs is fraudulent. Manfred is a tyrant, menacing his servants and family, but particularly chasing Isabella and attempting to lock her up. The strangeness of his own estates causes him all sorts of difficulties, but whether it's in the castle, its tunnels, the connected monastery, or the rocky caves outside, it is rarely long before Isabella is confined again. In perhaps the first subversion of a trope before it became one, it is Matilda that frees Theodore from his confinement, though he too spends much of the story in prison somewhere. The vast imbalance of power between Manfred and Isabella, and ultimately between God and Manfred, would become a genre staple. The one Gothic trope that perhaps was less defined here is the distinction between horror and terror. Gothic texts would typically be scary by suggesting something rather than showing it. But though the characters here are clearly running the full gamut of terror, Isabella in the scary tunnels and Manfred at the thought of losing his title, the influencing spirits are clearly shown in terms of apparitions and ghosts that warn both Theodore and Frederick, as well as menacing Manfred at times. There is no doubt around their veracity. A number of Gothic works play on this doubt and use it to comment on other periods of doubt. For example, Dracula's movements through London raise the questions of the role of technology of women in society and prevailing concerns about the ageing Queen Victoria and what that might mean for the end of her empire. In the castle of Otranto, Manfred has similar concerns about the end of his line, chasing an heir through Conrad and then, after his death, taking on the task himself. The chaste Matilda and the slightly more forthcoming Isabella, who comments on the unsuitability of one suitor, vehemently rejects another, and laments her own inability to decide for herself. We see the first steps here towards Mina Murray and Lucy Westerner. The fragility of the friar's position, his power plays with Manfred, also demonstrate doubts about the waning role of religion in society, which would continue to be a gothic trope into far more modern times. This is the old, old cliché of a book of three halves. The first, in which the villainous Manfred loses his son and pursues Isabella, is intriguing, exciting, and though the prose sometimes reads like this, at these words he flung out of the room in search of Isabella, leaving the amazed ladies thunderstruck with his words in frantic deportment and lost in vain conjectures on what he was meditating, which is distinctly wordy, making inflicting this book on schoolchildren a cruelty. It is though still interesting. As Theodore comes to the fore and the princesses are wailing, screaming and throwing themselves to the floor to prove how chaste they really are, it's really, really hard work. I'm pretty sure that nobody ever behaved like this unless it was entirely performative and there's 20 to 30 pages of it, which is a slog. Not just because it's insufferable, but because of the absence of punctuation, making it really hard to follow. I settle if the author could just decide what he's using punctuation for. Check out the dashes here. In the first example, it seems to denote one speaker interrupting another. In the second, one speaker is finished, but it still denotes a change in who's speaking. In the third, A is one character speaking still, though changing subjects. B is a change of speakers, and C and D denote an embedded sentence in one speaker's dialogue. If you can make any sense of this without very, very carefully reading it, you're doing well. There are 15 dashes here, and I'm going to color coordinate the different speakers. This is also a very good example of some of that melodrama previously mentioned. 
You'd hope anyone making as big a deal of dying as Frederick is here would do a good job of shuffling off the mortal coil, but even after this amount of crying and moaning, he actually survives. In the final third of the story, the castle of Otranto descends into a flurry of it turns out that twists that come out of nowhere and it soon turns out that it is actually an unintentionally funny. As each follows and is more absurd than its predecessor, this reads less like a gothic text and more like a farce. That it received such effusive praise from readers at the time makes me glad so few books from the period have survived. Due to its challenging language and nonsense plot, it is hard to recommend, but I think a few people out there may get a kick out of how silly it is. And if that sounds like you, then I recommend it to you. If you're reading this at school, I offer my sympathies. However, take it as a compliment, because this prose is extremely challenging, and if your teacher thinks that you can read it, then you're doing well. Thanks for listening. No video this time, so watching was optional. I'll see you in the next one. If you like and subscribe, you can buy my books on Amazon and on eBay.